is this too much? I mean, I feel like it's on, on brand for me personally, but is it too much to do an entire review in my dad's Indiana Jones hat? Hey guys, it's Sarah from Just My Typewriter, and I once again have a type test battle duel to the death and hopefully something explodes kind of video. So if you've been here before, you'll know that I really like to do type tests between machines in my collection. And I really like to do type tests between machines that are the same brand or are the same model, just a few removed. I was really lucky that when I went to Chicago to my first type in, I was actually traded for one of my Olympias, this beautiful Royal Safari from the 1960s. Beautiful yellow color, great case on it, and it has a script typeface. So it was my first script typewriter, my first typewriter trade, and I got to go on a really cool trip with it and travel via train. Now in 2021, I was actually gifted two broken typewriters for Christmas because that's the thing people like to give me for Christmas. And one of them was this Royal Safari 2. Now this looks more like an ultra portable. It's kind of 80s looking. It has a plastic case topper. And when I got it, it was broken. And it sat on my repair table for a really long time. I didn't know what to do with it. I couldn't get the carriage to move. I thought maybe it was locked. I couldn't unlock it. Basically, I just stabbed it a bunch with a screwdriver until it started moving, and now it operates perfectly. Now, these two machines are the same model type. They're both safaris, they're both made by Royal, but they look and feel really different, which is why we have to type test them. Now for some historical background. The Royal Safari model was actually kind of started in about 1963. Royal had lots of portable models in their line. They had the Royal Futura 800, 600, 400 series in that really atomic mid-century modern kind of vibe. And then in the 60s, they introduced their Royal Safari model, which had a much more rounded design to it. It was a lot wider and a lot heavier. Now this Safari body design is also displayed in things like the Royal Caravan, the Royal Custom, the Royal Aristocrat was also in this body design. And then in the 1970s, they actually moved to the Royal Sabre body design. And I have one of those in my collection. They look rather similar, but there are some slight differences in their construction. One of them was made in the United States. One of them was made in Portugal. And the Sabre doesn't have these extreme side panels on the sides of the keyboard as well. So they're kind of similar, but a little bit different. After you get through the Royal Saber machine, the typewriters from the Royal line look a lot different. And I had a lot of difficulty finding information about the Royal Safari 2. There were tons of ads about the Safari 1. In fact, I found a few that described the designer colors of these machines when they were released, which is a lot different than some of the other colors they've had in their line before. These were advertised as designer specific colors. So my typewriter's in antique gold, this yellow finish, but there was also regimental red, pottery blue, and pewter gray. I also found this advertisement that looked at the machines in the Royal line for different student types. So you could use a Royal Mercury when you were in junior high school, a little bit more like an ultra portable design on that, really lightweight. Then I guess when you move to high school, you get gifted a Royal Safari. So you ended up with the Royal Safari in high school. And apparently when you graduate to college, you really want to move with a boat anchor because they advertise the Royal Ultronic electric typewriter as the perfect machine for college students. Now, I love the look of a Royal Ultronic typewriter, and believe me, if I had one of those while I was an undergrad in college, I would be so cool. I love the design of these. I've never seen one in real life. I, they're so ugly that they're amazing to me, and if you ever find one in that bright green color, please contact me immediately. I am dying to get my hands on one. But that information was readily available, and there are lots of ads featuring the Royal Safaris from the 1960s. However, even in the typewriter database, there's not a ton of info on the Royal Safari 2, and there's even a Safari 3 and a Safari 4 model. When I was digging into information on the Safari 2 to put it into the typewriter database, I did discover that Royal did lease out some of their manufacturing to other typewriter companies out there in the universe. So they actually did lease their manufacturing for the Royal Safari 2 model to a company in Japan called Nakajima. My pronunciation is definitely off on that, but that company specifically made the Royal Safari 2 model 
for Royal, and it was actually based off of one of the designs of their portable typewriters. They only made the Royal Safari 2, according to the typewriter database, from about 1985 to 1987. And then from 1988 to 1989, they did make the Royal Safari 3 in Korea, and then from 1989 to 1990, they made the Safari 4 in Bulgaria? I don't really understand it, but there are some very strange variations of this Royal Safari branded name of model across the Royal line. Now, these typewriters obviously look really different than the Royal Safaris of the 60s, and they've got about 15 years in between them. The designs are much more portable based, even the screws are different on these, and I've talked about that before. On machines from like the 60s, you get the nice flat head design screw tops. On machines made in Japan or machines from the later 70s into the 80s, you get the Phillips head screw on all of the panels, which can be a pain to remove. <laughs> But this machine was manufactured in Japan. It's more like an ultra portable than a portable typewriter. It has a case topper that sits on top of it. It really only weighs about nine and a half to 10 pounds, way more portable than the portable Safari. In fact, I almost took the Safari with me to Disney World because it did fit in my backpack. But of course I had to test these two machines because they were similar enough for me to count it. So I did sit down and do a little bit of a type test. Now what I found on the Safari 1 model, which was made in the United States, there are a couple things that I really love about this machine, and there are some quirks about it that just kind of inhibit my typing a little bit. I love the color of this machine, and I am obsessed with the font on this machine. That typeface is just so fun to look at. It's really clean looking. That small Spencerian font is just really gorgeous. It's hard to get script machines, they're more expensive, and I'm very lucky to have this machine in my collection. However, when typing on it, I do find myself having a little bit of trouble typing for a long period of time. And there's a couple reasons. First of all, the big design around the keyboard, that bowl-like design across the front, really inhibits my typing for some reason. There's this plastic bar underneath the space bar that keeps your hands really far away from the keys. You kind of have to like jump over it to type on top of the keys, which is just not how I type. Although I do not type accurately or correctly according to the internet, but I do find that that kind of inhibits the amount of time I can spend using that keyboard. And it also has these really high side panels. Now, one thing about the Royal Sabre that I've talked about and I really prefer over the Royal Safari is that on the edges, they cut out this side detail and they do make this part in front underneath the spacebar a little bit thinner. So it's easier to type on that. So that design is a little bit different. And I find that the pitch, which is the height of the keys in conjunction with the typewriter, the slope that they have on there, is really high. So it does kind of limit the amount of time I can spend typing on that typewriter specifically. I'm not gonna sit down and write my dissertation on it, although it would look very pretty. I do, however, really like that aspect of the machine. It comes in a very heavy duty case, which I very much appreciate. And again, I love the aesthetics of this machine. And for me, getting over some of those typing quirks is way worth it for the font that you get to use on this machine. Now on to the Safari 2. This machine is way more like an ultra portable. They're way more lightweight. They don't have as much heft to them. But what I found really weird about this machine specifically is that on those key tops, you don't have that weird thing under the space bar anymore. Really easy to sit on top of the keys. It feels like the key tops are actually slanted so that the backs of them sit higher than the fronts. So your fingers kind of slide forward as you're typing on those individual keys. And I felt like my fingers were slipping off of those keys all the time. It's also not as heavy duty, obviously, when typing. So sometimes your ink can look a little bit less color deep on the machine itself, but it's super portable. I do wish that there was some sort of locking mechanism and maybe there is, and I haven't figured it out yet because I'm afraid of it and afraid of breaking it again. But I feel like the carriage return lever on it sits really high and you can move it down, but it's spring loaded. So it just kind of, pops up again. Both of these machines are really unique and I really appreciate having both of them in my collection, especially to compare against each other. What's really unique about the Safari 2 is there's no advertisements for it. There's no information for it. In fact, there's not even a real image in the typewriter database listing for it. There's a sketch. 
I just really appreciate that about this machine and I do find it to be super portable. Now, I love the Safari one, obviously, and I'm very excited to have her as part of my collection and as a mainstay in my collection. What's even better about these two machines in my collection is the story behind them for me personally. I was so lucky to be able to trade machines with another collector in order to get my Safari one, so I traded an Olympia for the script typewriter and I got to bring it home on a train 16 hours. Very long adventure, but very cool story to associate with this machine specifically, and I got it from another collector. What's amazing about this Safari 2 is I now get to give it to another collector. So I actually had a few typewriters listed on Facebook Marketplace, and I had a mom message me about one of my listings, and she told me that her son watches all of my videos and has started collecting typewriters, and he's about nine years old, and he would be honored to have one of my machines in his collection. Now, they live too far away from me to be really able to drive and pick up a machine, so I decided to send them one of my machines for free to help his collection and I felt that this machine was the perfect typewriter to go live with him. It's lightweight, it'll be a lot easier to ship than some of the other portables because it's smaller and it'll be easier to pack in a box and the young man who's going to be getting this typewriter doesn't have any ultra portables in his collection yet and this would be a great addition because it would be his first ultra portable and it's a little bit harder to find information about this typewriter specifically so it does kind of make it a little bit more unique a little bit more rare and even though it's a later model machine it's from the 80s so it's not an antique typewriter it's still a really cool looking machine and it's got a cool story to it so this machine right after this video is going in a box and being sent to New York to go live with my viewer Timmy so Timmy I hope you really like it so that's a little bit about the machines in my collection. These are two machines that I really enjoy having. Even though they've got their own quirks, they're two really interesting stories, and it's a very interesting look at the royal branding itself. There's a couple years between these two models, but they look totally different. And I do think that that does say something about the manufacturing process of typewriters as we get into later typewriter history. And there's not a lot of love out there for the machines of the 1970s and 1980s. And I definitely wanna promote that because because even though these machines are a little bit weirder looking and maybe not as vintage as they could be, they're still definitely great typewriters and worth having if you ever run into one. If you're interested in more typewriter content, there are more videos on this YouTube channel and I also have an Instagram at just.my.typewriter. I wanna thank you all so much for watching today and remind you that you're just my type writer.